Christmas Day, 1914. My dear sister Janet, it is 2 a.m. in the morning and most of our men are asleep in the dugouts. Yet I could not sleep myself before writing to you of the wonderful events of Christmas Eve. In truth, what happened seems almost like a fairy tale. And if I hadn't been through it myself, I would scarce believe it. Just imagine. While you and the family sang carols before the fire there in London, I did the same with enemy soldiers here on the battlefields of France. As I wrote before, there has been little serious fighting of late. The first battles of the war left so many dead that both sides have held back until replacements could come from home. So we have mostly stayed in our trenches and waited. But what a terrible waiting it has been, knowing that any moment an, art an artillery shell might land and explode beside us in the trench, killing or maiming several men. And in daylight, not daring to lift our heads above ground for fear of a sniper's bullet. And the rain. It has fallen almost daily. Of course, it collects right in our trenches, where we must bail it out with pots and pans. And with the rain has come mud, a good foot or so deep. It splatters and cakes everything and constantly sucks at our boots. One new recruit got his feet stuck in it, and then his hands too when we tried to get him out, just like in that American story of the tar baby. Through all this, we couldn't help feeling curious about the German soldiers across the way. After all, they faced the same dangers we did and slogged about it in the same muck. What's more, their first trench was only 50 yards from ours. Between us lay no man's land, bordered on both sides by barbed wire. Yet they were close enough we sometimes heard their voices. Of course, we hated them when they killed our friends. But other times, we joked about them and almost felt we had something in common. Now, it seems they felt the same. Just yesterday morning, Christmas Eve day, we had our first good freeze. Cold as we were, we welcomed it because at least the mud froze solid. Everything was tinged white with frost, while a bright sun shone over all. Perfect Christmas weather. During the day, there was little shelling or rifle fire from either side. And as darkness fell on our Christmas Eve, the shooting stopped entirely. Our first complete silence in months. We hoped it might promise a peaceful holiday, but we didn't count on it. We'd been told the Germans might attack and try to catch us off guard. I went to the dugout to rest, and lying on my cot, I must have drifted to sleep. All at once, my friend John was shaking me awake and saying, come and see what the Germans are doing. I grabbed my rifle, stumbled out of the trench, my head cautiously above the sandbags. I never hoped to see a stranger and more lovely sight. Clusters of tiny lights were shining all along the German line, left and right, as far as the eye could see. What is it? I asked in bewilderment. And John answered, Christmas trees. And so it was. The Germans had placed Christmas trees in front of their trenches, lit by a candle or lantern like beacons of goodwill. And then we heard their voices raised in song. This carol may not be familiar to us in Britain, but John knew it and translated, Silent Night, Holy Night. I've never heard one lovelier or meaningful in that quiet, clear night, its dark softened by a first quarter moon. When the song finished, the men in our trenches applauded. Yes, bridges soldiers applauding Germans. Then one of our own men started singing and we all joined in. 
the first Noel, the angel did say. In truth, we sounded not nearly as good as the Germans with their fine harmonies. But they responded with enthusiastic applause of their own, and then began another. O oh, Tannenbaum, O oh, Tannenbaum. Then we replied, O oh, come, all ye faithful. But this time they joined in, singing the same words in Latin. British and German harmonizing across no man's land. I would have thought nothing could be more amazing, but what came next was more so. English, come over! We heard one of them shout. You no shoot, we no shoot. There in the trench, as we looked at each other in bewilderment, then one of us shouted jokingly, You can come over here. To our astonishment, we saw two figures rise from the trench, climb over their barbed wire, and advance unprotected across no man's land. One of them called out, Send officer to talk. I saw one of our men lift his rifle to the ready, and no doubt others did the same, but our captain called out, Hold your fire. Then he climbed out and went to meet the Germans halfway. We heard them talking, and a few minutes later, the captain came back with a German cigar in his mouth. We've agreed there will be no shooting before midnight tomorrow, he announced. But sentries are to remain on duty, and the rest of you stay alert. Across the way, we could make out groups of two or three men starting out of trenches and coming toward us. Then some of us were climbing out too, and in minutes more, there we were in no man's land. Over a hundred soldiers and officers of each side shaking hands with men we'd been trying to kill just hours earlier. Before long, a bonfire was built, and around it we mingled, British khaki and German grey. I must say, the Germans were better dressed, with fresh uniforms for the holiday. Only a couple of our men knew German, but more of the Germans knew English. I asked one of them why that was. Because many have worked in England, he said. Before all this, I was a waiter in the Hotel Cecil. Perhaps I waited on your table. Perhaps you did, I said, laughing. He told me he had a girlfriend in London and that the war had interrupted their plans for marriage. I told him, don't worry, we'll have you beat by Easter. Then you can come back and marry the girl. He laughed at that. Then he asked if I'd send her a postcard he'd give me later. And I promised I would. Another German had been porter at Victoria Station. He showed me a picture of his family back in Munich. His eldest sister was so lovely, I said I should like to meet her someday. He beamed and said uh, he would like that very much, and gave me his family address. Even those who could not converse could still exchange gifts. Our cigarettes for their cigars, our tea for their coffee, our corned beef for their sausage. Badges and buttons from uniforms changed owners, and one of our lads walked off with the infamous spiked helmet. I myself traded a jackknife for a leather equipment belt, a fine souvenir to show when I get home. Newspapers changed hands too, and the Germans howled with laughter at ours. They assured us that France was finished and Russia nearly beaten too. We told them that was nonsense, and one of them said, well, you believe your newspapers and we'll believe ours. Clearly, they are lied to. Yet, after meeting these men, I wonder how truthful our newspapers have been. These are not the savage barbarians we've read so much about. These are men with homes and families, hopes and fears, principles, and yes, love of country. In other words, men like ourselves. Why are we led to believe otherwise? As it grew late, a few more songs were traded around the fire, and then all joined in for, I am not lying to you, old Lang Syne. Then we parted with promises to meet again tomorrow, and even some talk of a football match. <clears throat> I was just starting back to the trenches when an older German clutched my arm. My God, he said, why cannot we have peace and all go home? I told him gently, that you must ask your emperor. He looked at me then, searchingly, 
perhaps, my friend, but also we must ask our hearts. And so, dear sister, tell me, has there ever been such a Christmas Eve in all history? And what does it all mean, this impossible befriending of enemies? For fighting here, of course, it means regrettably little. Decent fellows those soldiers may be, but they follow orders, and we do the same. Besides, we are here to stop their army and send it home, and never could we shirk from that duty. Still, one cannot help imagine what would happen if the spirit shown here were caught by the nations of the world. Of course, disputes must always arise, but what if our leaders were to offer well wishes in place of warnings, songs in place of slurs, presents in place of reprisals, would not all war end at once? All nations say they want peace. Yet on this Christmas morning, I wonder if we want it quite enough. Your loving brother, Tom. <laughs>